through the ministry of John the Baptist as he prepares the way for the Lord. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. And he said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning as sinners, as redeemed sinners, as sinners that you have chosen for your own glory to redeem. And as we consider the ministry of John the Baptist, we see both a call to repentance and a reminder for us to walk in daily repentance. We ask, Lord, that you would illumine our minds. Your scripture is perfect. It is a lamp, a light unto our feet. It does not need illumination, but our minds do. We ask, Lord, therefore, that you would help us to understand these words that you have written, that you have inspired. We, help, we ask, Lord, that you would help us in being obedient to these words, that even those of us who have repented would heed the warnings of John the Baptist. We also ask, Lord, that as we share the gospel, as we call on others to repent, that we would be as bold and as righteous as John the Baptist in so doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the biblical answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, is simple. Repent and believe. Now those two concepts, repentance and faith or believing, those two concepts must be distinguished, but they cannot be separated. Really, repentance and faith or repentance and belief are two sides of the same coin. Where there is genuine repentance, there is genuine faith. And, and where there is genuine faith, there has already been true repentance. In fact, oftentimes in Scripture, both of those terms appear alongside one another in the context of salvation. Mark chapter 1 Verse 15 says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Acts chapter 20, verse 21 notes testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. However, in other portions of scripture, only belief or faith is mentioned. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There, salvation, and the answer is not repent and believe, but just believe. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Paul famously stated, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All of these answer the question, what must I do to be saved by saying faith, believe. There's a third group of verses in scripture, however, 
that speak only of repentance. Luke 13, verse 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. You see, what Scripture is showing us is that the concepts of faith and repentance imply one another. And they are so closely related that when one is used, it is a stand-in for the other. They are used interchangeably. Repentance places more emphasis on turning away from sin. Faith puts more emphasis on turning to Christ. But as you turn away from sin, you necessarily turn to Christ. And as you turn to Christ, you necessarily turn away from sin sin. And so as John articulates true repentance, he is speaking of nothing more and nothing less than what genuine faith looks like. In in our passage this morning, John mentions only repentance. But we've already heard from James 2 that says the exact same thing. He mentions faith. This is what faith, this is what repentance looks like. In this passage, there are several truths that show us, tell us, what genuine repentance looks like. So look with me at verse 7, and we'll actually consider verses 7 and 9 together. Genuine repentance, true repentance, recognizes judgment. Genuine biblical repentance needs to recognize the reality of and seriousness of divine judgment. As John the Baptist is preaching, crowds begin to form. And these crowds start to gather around, they start to form, and they start to ask John that he baptize them. John is preaching, he is he's preaching, he's demanding repentance and promising forgiveness, and he is baptizing people to signify their washing, their cleansing from sin. That baptism was a public way for his audience to symbolize their repentance and their receiving of divine forgiveness. And so as these crowds begin to form and come to him, they ask that they be baptized. And this crowd came from the entire region where he was regularly preaching. In Matthew's account... Matthew records that Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And Mark says that they were being baptized by him and confessing their sin. However, that crowd, that crowd of people, was also generally following the scribes and Pharisees. And Luke, in his account, doesn't single them out. It just says the crowds came. But Matthew does. In in Matthew chapter 3, he says this, But when he, that's John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to him, that them, you brood of vipers. And and in Luke's account, he says says it to the whole crowd. Uh, Evidently, while this crowd did contain a few genuinely repentant people, who John subsequently would baptize, The majority of the crowd is simply following the Pharisees. And John's sharp rebuke, therefore, is to the crowd who would follow a false teacher, and then to the false teachers themselves. He identifies them as a brood of vipers. Now that phrase is unique to John, but there is Old Testament precedent for referring to the enemies of God as snakes or vipers. Egypt in Jeremiah 46, the Philistines, and even Israel herself in Isaiah 59 are referred to as snakes when they are opposing God. The parallel that John is making is to a snake's venom and therefore dangerous nature. Psalm chapter 58 verse 4 says of the wicked, they are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth speaking lies. 
They have venom like the venom of a serpent. Psalm 104 calls evil men who plan evil things in their hearts and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. See, see what, is, what John is saying is the most dangerous part of a snake is their mouth. You don't have to worry about the tail. You have to worry about the mouth. So it is with the Pharisees. The greatest danger that they posed was their teaching. It is what they would say with their words. It was their lies. Lies are the great enemy of the truth. And those who are experts in false teaching and in deceptive lies are the greatest danger to anyone who hears them. John's condemnation here is not unlike Jesus' own words to the Pharisees later on. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. Jesus says that Satan is a murderer and a liar because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. And then John asks the crowd, who warned you? To flee from the wrath to come. When there is a brush fire, the snakes would come slithering out of the woods, out away from the burning fire. What, what John is pointing out is they want to flee judgment, but they didn't want repentance. They wanted baptism. They wanted the outward sign of repentance, but they had no intention of changing their character from that of a snake. They wanted John's baptism as fire insurance. They wanted the outward sign of a changed life, but they did not want a changed life. They wanted to flee from the wrath to come, but to do so on their own terms. They wanted to flee from wrath, from judgment, but they did not want to flee. They had no intention of fleeing from their own sin. Genuine repentance recognizes the reality of coming judgment in connection with sin. The Old Testament prophets often spoke of judgment. John's hearers would have been well acquainted with the concept of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, which pictures God's cataclysmic future judgment. Isaiah wrote, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy it, sinners from it. Amos says to Israel, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! Why would you have the day of the Lord? And then he describes it as a day of inescapable judgment. As if a man fled from a lion only to be met by a bear. As if a man would flee from harmful serpents and finally get to safety in his house and lean his hand against a wall and only find a snake in the wall. Zephaniah called it the burning, the day of the burning anger of the Lord. And Malachi rhetorically asked, who can endure the day of his coming? And so John's audience knew that God was holy. And they knew that God would judge sinners. That didn't surprise them. What offended them was John's insistence that they were sinners. And that they, therefore, needed to repent. And dear friends, I would submit to you that it is the same today. What offends people is not that God will judge someone like Hitler or Stalin or Paul Pot. What is offensive about Christianity is its unrelenting insistence that God will judge me and you. That you must repent. And sadly, many people today are much the same as this brood of vipers who came out to hear John. They are anxious to hear preaching. They want to be at church. They want to be baptized. They, they want all of the Christian trappings, but they don't want Christ. They want to hold on to their sin. They don't want to think about judgment, so they protect themselves. They insulate themselves with religious, religiosity. 
They, they want the external trappings of religion like baptism, but they are not willing to repent of their sin, to change their mind, to change their heart, and to change their direction. They cannot surrender their will to Christ, but they want to be outwardly associated with him. That is the mindset of the people who came to John. They didn't want repentance. They wanted fire insurance just in case there is a coming judgment. Genuine repentance recognizes the absolute reality of coming judgment. And genuine repentance knows that judgment is a holy response to sin. Genuine repentance is not then merely interested in outward external rituals, but in inward transformation. There is more to repentance than scrambling away from the burning bush of judgment. God has always hated, he's detested hypocritical religion. He said of Israel that they draw near to him with their mouths. They honor him with their lips, but in reality, their hearts were far from him. Later, he would rebuke on them for drawing on his name, but refusing truth and righteousness, Isaiah 48. Jeremiah said concerning the Israel of his day that God was near their lips, but far from their mind. John likewise rebukes the hypocritical desire to be baptized of this crowd led by the Pharisees. There are many in churches today that are just going through the motions. They want the outward trappings. They, they want religiosity. God is close to their lips on, on Sunday morning, but he is far from their minds and hearts all week long. They want to avoid judgment like snakes fleeing a fire, but they will not repent of their own wickedness. And then John doubles down. He doubles down and he calls on the crowd to consider that even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Meaning judgment is near. Judgment is imminent. Judgment is at any moment now. Before you would chop down a tree, you would place the blade of the axe against the tree. To make your spot, you'd mark your spot right where you're going to swing. You'd touch the tree with the axe before you pulled back to take a full swing. That's the image here. The, the axe is up against the tree. It has marked its spot. Now all that has to happen is for the swing to come down in full force. And again, John finds himself in prophetic succession to Old Testament prophets. When the Old Testament prophets spoke of judgment, it was always with the sense of imminence. That it could happen at any moment. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. For the day of the Lord, Lord draws near on all the nations. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. If you look at the Old Testament, there have been many days of the Lord, and they all foreshadow and serve as prelude to the final coming day of the Lord. John's preaching picked up on that theme of nearness, of that imminence of judgment, knowing that the historical judgments of God on Israel and the nations were only precursors to the coming day of the wrath of the Lamb. And John is saying that unless your life bears the change associated with genuine repentance, then that tree will be cut down and thrown into judgment. Genuine repentance recognizes not simply the reality of divine judgment, but it recognizes the imminence of it. And the truly repentant person recognizes that they are deserving of divine judgment. But there's a second reality that we learn about genuine repentance. And it is what John spends the most time on. It is seen in verse 8, and then he really explains it in verses 10 to 14. And we've touched on this already, but as I say, it is John's primary point. Really, you could say his thesis is found in verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. 
In other words, what he's saying is the fruit of your life, your lifestyle, your actions must be consistent with the change of mind, the change of heart, and the change of direction of genuine repentance. Real repentance, true faith, manifests itself in concrete action. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus tells that story, you'll be familiar with, that the tower that fell on Shalom and, uh, Shalom and killed 18 people. And he asks, do you think that, that those sinners that, that perished in that accident were worse sinners than anyone else in all of Jerusalem? And then he answers his own question and says, no, but I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And significantly, the very next parable that he told to the crowd had to do with bearing fruit. A, a man had a fig tree and planted it in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir... Let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put it on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is why James, our Lord's brother, wrote that we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Genuine repentance will result in a genuine change of conduct, a genuine change and lifestyle. And the people are coming to ask John for baptism. And they needed to be told that their baptism was essentially a public and formal commitment to change one's life. Their baptism was a commitment to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Paul, you remember when he was before King Agrippa, relates the same truth. He's explaining why the Jews have tried to have him killed. And he says, it is because he declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles. Same, same message for everyone. What was he saying? Acts chapter 26 verse 20, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. That was Paul's ministry. And so the crowds respond to John's preaching and they ask him, what then shall we do? In other words, what they're asking specifically, what is this fruit? What this fruit is, is what they want to know. What, what exactly are these deeds in keeping with repentance? They know that baptism symbolizes the washing of the heart. They understood that. So as they come to John, they are essentially asking what effect that washing has on their conduct. What is the product that reflects true repentance? Now how John answers that question is very important. First, I want you to notice that John does answer the question. What must I do? And John answers the question. See, a lot of Christians today don't answer that question. They will respond with something like, oh, there's nothing you can do. Christ has done it all. Or they will say, you can only believe. You must believe the gospel harder. But please notice that while John does point people to Christ in verses 15 to 17, he also answers the question. You say, why? It's because John is not talking about the divine side of salvation, nor is he talking about justification. Justification is how we are declared innocent by God. What he is talking about is the human side of salvation. You must repent. And he's talking about sanctification. The lifestyle that testifies to and is shaped by that genuine repentance. It is, of course, true that there is nothing you or I can do to earn God's election, nor is there anything that you or I can do to merit his justification. But, dear friends, that's not the topic here. This is about the sinner repenting and the lifestyle that is then lived out in the genuine believer's life. This is about sanctification. 
the ever ongoing process of increasing Christ likeness in the life of the Christian. So John isn't preaching on justification here. And so John answers the question. But notice also that John doesn't answer the question with a specific right or action. In, in other words, he doesn't say that there is a specific single action you must undertake. Uh, otherwise, he, he would have said something simple like, well, just be baptized and you're good. He, he doesn't want to give a specific thing that, rep that a repentant person must do. In fact, we can see this because he's asked the question different times by different groups. A and Luke is condensing this into a single account for us. The crowd asks in verse 12, what must we do? Or, or there was 10, and then verse 12, the tax collectors come and ask them. And then verse 14, the soldiers come to him and they ask the same question. See, if there was a, a single Christian ritual that we had to do, like pray five times a day or face this way or travel to this location, then he would have just given that answer. But John actually gives three different answers. You say, why? Because the fruit of a genuine Christian will manifest, that a genuine Christian will manifest, will be unique to their life. It is the ongoing direction and actions of your life. And the specific application and actions will be different depending on where God has placed you. But looking at his answers, we can discern three unique attitudes Three general principles, general dispositions that must affect your actions in whatever state of life you are. And Christianity is not a religion that says you must do this religious ritual. It is a religion that says if you have genuinely repented, if you have genuinely been changed, then that change on the inside will manifest on the outside. And one last note briefly, John did not answer the question by calling the crowd to his aesthetic lifestyle. He, he did not say, don't participate in society, go off and live in the wilderness like I did. That was unique to his prophetic calling. And so instead, John focuses on actions, on tangible, concrete things that a person could do in their unique situation. And so what are those principles that need to inform our actions as we live for Christ? What is the underlying spirit that must inform our actions regardless of our specific situation? The first is generosity. John says, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. The image of giving someone a tunic was in basic continuity with the Old Testament expectation for how a person should treat his fellow humans, especially the poor. In Ezekiel 18, the prophet is speaking about a righteous man who does what is just and right. And he says that he gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with his garment. Paul defines Christians in much the same way. Ephesians 4.28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Why? Why must a Christian do that? So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. In that culture, it was common to wear multiple garments. The days were quite hot, but the evenings would actually get quite cold. And so what people would do is they would wear a garment, a tunic, under their outer cloak as extra protection against the cold. It would be worn underneath the main robe that would have been worn over top. And it was not uncommon for people to wear two of these under tunics or to have an extra one packed on your person in case the night gets cold. And so the person who is wearing two under tunics or under garments should lend one to the man that doesn't have any extra protection. If a man perhaps couldn't afford it, he would lack that extra protection and he would only wear the outer robe. A and what John is saying is that if you have two garments, you should freely give one away. And what is true of uh, clothes is also true of food. 
And so it's clear that John is emphasizing the principle of generosity and love towards a fellow man, especially those who are poor or needy. Generosity, then, is a primary characteristic of those who have genuinely repented. And such a truth makes a lot of sense. It is the repentant person, it is the Christian that, of all people, should know what it is to give generously. God has graciously and generously offered mercy and forgiveness to the sinner who repents. The more aware of our sin we are, the more we will see the generous and merciful offer of forgiveness from that sin. And the more our conduct will be shaped by being generous then to others. It is for the sinner that, as Paul says, has been given all the riches in the heavenly places. If that sinner then turns around and withholds earthly riches from others, it is to show that they have no true understanding of the offer of God's forgiveness to you. It shows your repentance is spurious. The second general principle that John talks about is honesty or integrity. Tax collectors who are among the crowd that has come up to John, these tax collectors come and they approach and they ask what repentance would look like in their case. And John says, again, rather simply, collect no more than you are authorized to do. The way taxes worked in the Roman Empire is that city rulers would lease the right to collect taxes in the city. And so what would happen is people would bid for the right to collect taxes in their city. And they would pay Rome whatever their bid was. So an upfront capital investment, if you will. They would pay upfront. And so what would happen is if somebody was a tax collector, it meant that they had to pay an upfront cost to lease the right from Rome to collect taxes within the city. And so they would collect the taxes that Rome required, that Rome stipulated, but then they would also add a surcharge on top of that to recoup their upfront costs, as well as any ongoing costs that they had, like paying employees, which was also common. Now this additional charge, this surcharge, was not governed by Rome at all. And only Rome and the tax collector knew what he paid for the lease. And so he had total freedom when it came to that surcharge. And col collecting taxes in that day, kind of like today, was also fairly complex. There was a general citizen's tax. There were property taxes. There were sales tax of various types. And there were other types of taxation as well. And so because of these factors, abusing the system was both easy and common. And so the tax collectors would inflate the numbers. And they would increase that surcharge, and they had the backing of Rome to collect. As a result, tax collectors were wealthy, but largely hated by the Jews. The occupation of being a tax collector, in fact, made them ceremonially unclean. They were despised as social outcasts. And the testimony of a tax collector was not accepted in court because their reputation was sullied because of their constant dishonesty and lack of integrity when collecting taxes. The Jewish citizens regarded this surcharge as nothing more than robbery. And John's response, interestingly, does not disregard the whole profession. John was no political revolutionary. John does not call on the tax collector to give up their profession. He therefore legitimizes the proper collecting of taxes. But he says that they are to conduct their business with complete honesty and integrity, transparency. They should collect only what they are authorized to by Rome. There was to be no surcharge, no extortion, no bribes, no kickbacks, no payoffs, no nothing. Just collect the amount that Rome requires. Now this would have been a radical departure from what every tax collector was doing. And from what everyone would have expected. Their honesty, their integrity was to be thorough and complete in everything they did, even if their entire profession 
was corrupt. Even if their entire industry was known for corruption, they needed to be known for integrity. This is another sign of genuine repentance. A total and complete honesty and integrity in all of your dealings. The call was to have a level of integrity that stood out among the tax or the toll collectors. When a sinner repents, we come to God, we are called to be honest about our sin before God. In fact, when a sinner repents, we have to acknowledge the very worst part of ourselves to God who knows all things. Those who are repentant, therefore, those who are accountable to God, the God who knows the very worst parts of us, we can't then turn around and go out and attempt to deceive others or take advantage of them. It would be a wholesale rejection of our repentance. And so matter, no matter what your profession is, you are called as a Christian to be completely truthful and honest in all of your dealings. In short, John says, the fruit that he is talking about, the fruit in keeping with genuine repentance, is to be a person of the highest integrity. And this is evidence that a person has genuinely repented. But there's a third major principle that must underlie our lives, and that is contentment. Contentment. After the tax collectors approach John, soldiers do so. And they ask the same question. Well, then what should we do? What should we do? How would the washing, the, the symbolized washing in John's baptism of repentance apply to them? Now, these are not Roman soldiers, but Jewish ones. In fact, it's likely that these are either the temple police or, even more likely, they were soldiers that would travel with and protect the tax collectors. Notice how they approach saying, we also. That, that might indicate that they were in fact soldiers that assisted and protected the tax collectors. And John answers and says, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. It, this likely applies to their work in protection. They were going to be in situations where their boss, a tax collector might use them to intimidate people into paying the surcharge or threaten to even use violence to ensure that this happened. And so John says, don't do that. You may not take advantage of one another and you can't use the excuse that you were just following orders. Don't extort money from people and threaten them with either violence or false accusations. And so as the tax collectors were to act with integrity and not abuse their power, so too were their soldiers. But then John says, and be content with, their, with your wages. The soldiers were to be content with what they made. Now, generally speaking, in those days, soldiers made a daily wage, which was generally quite minimal, as well as daily provision. And so food for the days they were working was provided by the employer, and then they would receive a small stipend on top of that. It was typically speaking not a lucrative position. And that would be a temptation to extort or use other means to make additional income, especially because their employees were often very wealthy. But John forbids the action. But he now also speaks to the mindset that precedes the action. In other words, he's saying if you are content, the temptation to use illegal or unjust means to secure additional income is substantially lessened. In other words, John is saying that if you are genuinely repentant, genuine repentance will not only show up in your actions, but also in your attitudes. Again, John did not tell these soldiers to lay down their weapons and to leave the army. Being a soldier is an honorable profession and a worthwhile occupation. But John instead speaks directly to their character. The, the issue wasn't being a soldier. The issue was what kind of soldier they would be. They were to be content with what they were given. And, and this, again, follows logically from a repentant heart. 
Think about it. The genuinely repentant person has entrusted himself or herself to God. We are not our own, Paul says. We were bought with a price. We have repented. We have left ourselves for the cause of God who has forgiven our moral debt. Repentance and discontentment, therefore, are like oil and water. They repel each other. You cannot repent and entrust yourself to God and then not be content with what he has seen fit to give you. Whatever situation we are in, we are to be content because we have repented. We have turned to the Lord. We have said, not my will, but yours. We can't turn around and then complain about his will as if we know better. So we will be content. It's also worth noting that all three of these examples have to do with money or material goods. John says, be generous and give your extra cloak to someone who has none. He says, don't be dishonest and take more taxes than you are supposed to. And then he says, be content with your wages. Now, while it is certain that the Christian life, the repentant life, touches on more than money, it is true that money and material things provide perhaps the clearest insight into your heart. And notice, it isn't a matter of having or not having stuff. It is a matter on how you treat your stuff. Generosity, integrity, and contentment do not require a lot, nor do they require a little. They require a repentant heart. Your attitude about your stuff provides a very clear window into the genuineness of your repentance. Go with me to back to verse 8. And we'll close with this. There's a final aspect of repentance that I want to look at. After saying bear fruits in keeping with repentance, John says, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And he warns them, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Real repentance, genuine repentance rejects false religion. John knowing the attitude of the Pharisees and the Jews in general, anticipates their response, and he cuts it off at the pass. He, he, John is emphatic here that they not even begin to think such a thought, that they don't need to repent because they are children of Abraham. See, they believed that because they were Jews, sons of Abraham, that that alone granted them access into God's kingdom. It was their religious reliance on ancestry that John condemns. And they would look at the Old Testament, particularly the, the promises that God made to Israel, and they would note that God made these irrevocable, unconditional promises to Abraham. And there is an element of truth to that. In fact, there's always an element of truth to false religion. Genesis 17 records God speaking to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting con covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And, and so they rested in that and in the sign of the covenant, namely circumcision. However, in so doing, they neglected the very meaning of that sign. The sign of circumcision was in part a warning that they could be cut off and cast away from God's promises. That is why it only served as a picture of circumcising your heart. Deuteronomy 10 verse 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and no longer be stubborn. Later, Jeremiah promises wrath for those Israelites that would not repent and circumcise their hearts. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your heart, O men of Judah, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. Such a warning sounds suspiciously like John's warning. The Old Testament is perfectly clear that God's promises are unconditional and that they will be fulfilled. But they are corporate promises. And the Old Testament is equally clear that salvation is not corporate but individual. That is why so much stress in the Old Testament itself is placed on the faithful remnant. 
Because it was clear that only those who repented would inherit the promises of Abraham. Paul makes this clear in Romans when he says, But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. Later in that same letter, he would say, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and are not all children of Abraham because they are of his offspring. But he says this, But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise who are counted as offspring. And you say, well, where does Paul get that theology? Dear friends, he goes back to the Old Testament with the example of Jacob and Esau to demonstrate that it was always the remnant of faith who would receive the promises. This is why Isaiah said, in that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And then he says this, A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Isaiah chapter 10. Had John's audience have truly loved the Old Testament, they went, never would have denied repentance on the grounds that they were Abraham's children. Rather, they would have seen that as the reason why they of all people must repent. And true repentance, genuine repentance does not rely, does not count on ancestry or heritage. It relies only on God. True repentance is to embrace God alone, not God and something else. Notice the power of salvation is with God. God is able from these stones to make children of Abraham. Sadly, there are many in the church today who view themselves as Christians because they go to church or because their parents were believers and they grew up in a so-called Christian home or Christian society. John's warning is clear. Do not even begin to think that way. You must repent. Dear friends, salvation it's not a matter of ancestry, but of God's power, such that even he could make stones sons of Abraham if he so desired. Genuine repentance recognizes the reality of judgment. It, it manifests itself in a changed life. And dear friends, it renounces false religion. It rests alone on the power of God. Well, there is another key reality of genuine repentance, and that is that it seeks after Christ. But if you want to hear about that, you'll have to come back next week. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that John's message was countercultural when he gave it, and it has certainly not become more culturally acceptable in the time since he gave it. And yet we recognize that it is the message of salvation, that you must repent, that all those who repent, who forsake their sin, who turn to Christ, will be saved, will experience forgiveness and mercy. But of all those who refuse repentance, of all those who don't manifest genuine repentance in their lives, who have given no evidence of a genuine change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of direction, no matter how righteous they think themselves, no matter what their ancestry is, no matter what their upbringing was like, they will not experience mercy and forgiveness. And yet the most wretched sinner, the most dishonest, the most violent tax collector, the most angry, discontent, vile soldier, the most wretched sinner could come to Christ, could manifest true repentance and be saved. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to work, that you would make out of stone hearts sons and daughters of Abraham. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'll have the worship team